the more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe about us, the less taste we shall have for destruction. Rachel Carson. For thousands of years, stunning petroglyphs on the volcanic tablelands near Bishop, California, shimmered in the starlight. Undisturbed for all to enjoy, they stood in testament to a great people who called the Owens Valley home. But an age-old menace struck. On a cold, dark, windy night in California, a site of sacred value would be forever changed. Looters with rock saws and chisels destroyed this ancient site in a single act of evil, which has left everybody with one question. Why? So the geology of this area is, is truly fascinating. This, this whole tablelands, this entire bluff that you see was, was all formed in a single event. And basically what happened is the entire Long Valley caldera, which is up near Mammoth, exploded. It sent three cubic miles of material straight up into the air. When that material stopped going up and returned back to Earth, it plunged into a bathtub of molten lava. That lava was then sloshed out into a wave of lava that actually came downhill and traveled about 20 miles. And then over time it solidified into the single plane. And that's the rock substrate to which all these petroglyphs are based upon. They're ceremonial, they're stories. Uh, a lot of them, you know, people don't know. We know that people did them a long time ago and they're used for different purposes. Some for personal reasons and some for to tell stories and tell us about the place we live in. Petroglyphs in particular are where the exterior sheen or skin of the rock has been removed to reveal the lighter uh, underside uh, interior of the rock. And so that provides a, a color relief and um, there are various symbols and motifs. Um, and you know, there's a lot of question as to their meaning and function. You should probably ask the tribal member about that. What archeologists and, and researchers don't understand is the spirituality part of the petroglyphs. It's a very important tie because it allows us to get into the mindset of prehistoric and historic individuals. The first time that I heard about the destruction, is, you just can't believe it because the question is why? Why would somebody want to take the time, the energy, anything to, to bother those, you know? I see some destruction in the past where it's been like gunshots or, you know, usually it's random, people don't even know they're doing it a lot, but not to intentionally cut them out. It was from up here, and then once I got through with that, then it moved down to here. And, and that's where it's always remained. Then I came back and, and I talked to a couple of the elders and they really didn't have any words. They were just wondering, they just said like, why? You know, and, and it's like, well, we can't explain why. We don't, you know, we don't know. I've completely changed my course of careers uh, to pursue and protect these cultural resources. And I, and I take that job very seriously. And to come across this, this site, it was like a personal attack on me. Um, everything I stand for, everything I do in the course of my day had, had been violated. The first day I saw the vandalized petroglyphs was a really emotional day, one of the hardest days of my career. I was not prepared for how bad it was going to be when I got on site. It was truly devastating. My, my initial reaction whenever I heard of the destruction of these petroglyphs outside of Bishop was shock. It's sad to think that these petroglyphs that have probably existed for at least a thousand years in this, in this locality uh, have been destroyed and defaced. So this is the first damage site that was identified by the, the site steward. He pulled in the parking lot, he got out of his vehicle, he looked over here, he immediately saw that this had been damaged. A and sadly, they cut through the top of that, damaging it. So they made a couple of cuts with the radial saw and then they used a chisel to get behind it and chisel it out and really created a lot of damage as you can see here. It's really a sad, sad event. This definitely, to me, constitutes a premeditated attack on an archaeological site. It's not just these individuals walking through their local uh, forest and picking up a projectile point. This is definitely something that they thought out beforehand and they went out there prepared to destroy this archaeological site. This was actually an unsuccessful attempt by these guys to, to remove the petroglyph. Obviously, it's still intact. And propping oneself up is one cut with a rotary saw that weighs 40 pounds would be quite a challenge yet they're willing to go to those risks. Not to mention that from this perspective, I can see the highway 
and I would be quite visible and there'd be a big cloud of dust around me. So these guys were obviously very bold. Uh, nevertheless, they attempted to remove this uh, petroglyph motif. Uh, they failed because they weren't able enough to remove it without damaging it. You can see that on the upper left side, they got their cold chisel to start removing the patina and they started destroying the glyph. So they just abandoned this one and moved on around the corner. When the site was vandalized, um, we r really were able to rally a lot of outrage locally, regionally, and I think because of that public peer pressure, um, we were able to recover the stolen pieces. Re related to the petroglyph damage, we did recover all of the uh, stolen petroglyphs. We received an anonymous tip um, recently about the location of the petroglyphs. They were said to be in a public place. We went out there and we picked them up and there they were. We do not have a suspect at this point. This is the third and fourth petroglyph panel that was actually impacted by these, these thieves. This is a really good example of where we are today. Even though we've recovered the petroglyphs, we're not gonna be able to put them back into place with any kind of ease. Sadly, uh, we're gonna have to come up with a B plan with how we're gonna restore this area. And I, I think it serves as a, a really good uh, reminder uh, for future generations if we can use it as an educational tool. There's many laws that pertain to archaeological sites, dozens in fact. Um, the ones that are pertinent to this particular case really is the Archaeological Resources Protection Act of 1979. So ARPA in 1979 was passed as a way to solidify those definitions and to come up with a uniform code that could be um, applied in a fair and constitutionally sound way. So what ARPA did, the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, was it strengthened that quite a bit. And it established fines that are quite steep, actually. The first time offense is a $20,000 fine and up to a year in jail. And if you have a second offense, it's up to $100,000 and five years in jail. Those are some pretty stiff fines. And that doesn't even include the civil penalties or the loss of your equipment and your vehicles if you're caught. So in addition to the, the penalties, if you use your vehicle in the commission of an ARPA crime, meaning you, you take artifacts across state lines using a vehicle and those artifacts are actually removed illegally, or if you use the, the vehicle in the commission of your crime within the state, that your vehicle can actually be seized by the federal government. Some of my earliest exposure with archaeology was just going out with my family or uh, even in high school with my friends and collecting bottles from historic archaeological sites and projectile points from prehistoric archaeological sites. Pot hunting and looting more or less are the same thing. They're two terms for the same activity. It's unauthorized, illegal excavation of archaeological sites by people who are not there in the interest of preservation. Looting is what we kind of call it now. Pot hunting was a term that came out of the U.S. Southwest where it was first initially determined to be a problem. People were hunting for pots for pottery. And so it's kind of a it's kind of a casual term for that. So in the Owens Valley, like a lot of places in North America, casual collecting, sometimes even by whole families on weekends, is, has been viewed as a, a legitimate pastime. We're looking for a lot of different stuff like that while we're up there, just mainly to keep the kids interested, but it also gave us something to do while we're doing up there and looking around. It is very difficult when a family member realizes that activities that they might have engaged in with their families um, and I sort of call it generational looting or recreational looting when people go out and it has been perfectly acceptable to go out on a Sunday afternoon and go see what you can find. It's all about the treasure hunt. They should share with their family members what they learned and it's not going to be easy because their family may not want to hear that. Um, but I would still ask them to step up, try to do the right thing. And I think that eventually we'll make a difference because we'll get the word out to enough people. And it'll be peer pressure that's going to change those generational attitudes uh, that up to this point in many families have been ex perfectly acceptable. I caught a father and son out walking on an archaeological site in a grid pattern. Sadly, many people don't see the impact that this casual kind of looting would 
would have on an archaeological site. They think if you're not actually digging or excavating or sifting through the soil, that you're not really damaging anything. And I know where a bunch of the burial mounds are. I found it, uh, Indian artifacts all along like Chico Creek, Upper Park, been to the fossil wall in the Upper Park. They thought it was fine to pick up this projectile point. So it was a good opportunity to work with this father and son and explain some of the laws and um, get an ally in this case. I think they're like cool little trinkets to have. Like a, like a coffee table book, like an artifact fit there. <laughs> yeah, actually I probably would. If I was hiking, I probably would pick up like artifacts and stuff. I do not know the laws pertaining to picking and keeping things that you find. Yeah, me either. You can't do that? I would be surprised to hear that there are laws. I could see that if there was, but I don't think there should be a law. Yeah, I know there are laws. Yeah, that's just about everywhere. There's, you know, state parks and all that other stuff, or even in the city park, you're not allowed to touch and remove. What I have before me is 11 ammo boxes. This is, uh, represents the work of a single family over about a 20 year period here in the Owens Valley. And it, it serves as a really good graphic illustration of what kind of impact uh, casual looting just by the family off the surface in the course of a weekend can have. Anytime you remove an artifact from its location in archeology, span what we call provenience, uh, a lot of information about that artifact is lost. Um, you, you lose uh, the, the, the setting uh, and the location of the artifact which a lot of the time uh, is the majority of the information that you can learn from that artifact. Artifacts are little pieces of information. They're packets of information, and part of the information is not just in the artifact itself, but it's in its three-dimensional location in the ground, where it is relative to other things. There are certain types of materials that we can't subject to dating techniques, and so the only way we know how old it is is where it is in the ground relative to something else that is datable. And once you pull that out of that context, you're losing a lot of the information that it once had. Each archeological site may be out there maybe like a book. And if you take a book and start removing pages from it, in this case, the comparison would be somebody going out to an archeological site, pulling out a couple of artifacts out of there. It's like ripping pages out of that history book. It's like pulling out a piece of the puzzle that we can never replace. And it may seem insignificant, something that someone feels they need to put on their fireplace mantle, but it may be the one thing that helps link that story together with what indigenous population was doing um, or what was happening um, in, in that area thousands of years ago. Somebody goes out a year later and does the same thing. Somebody goes out there and digs it up. We start ripping out a chapter and some of the bigger damage. Pretty soon you're left with a history book with just bits and pieces of a story. So really it's not about somebody collecting an artifact, it's really about damaging the site and removing those items out of the context of the site and losing that story. Who was here before? Archaeologists can go out there and determine what cultures were out there, what times, what, how they were preparing food, how they were living, um, the size of a community, and if all that stuff starts disappearing, it's lost. We've lost, uh, we've lost part of our heritage from that. When you pick up something that's laying out there and take it, it's gone. It's, it's uh, no longer there for anybody else to see. It doesn't belong to them for one thing. And, and it's like tearing a page out of a book for the archeologists because they can't put the whole picture together if a piece is missing. The Clovis technology was uh, relatively short-lived in North America, and because it is so short-lived and it is potentially some of the first individuals to be populating North America, these Clovis projectile points that we find uh, relatively few and far between are generally just lying on the surface and can date back to 12,000 years ago. So uh, just one of those being picked up and removed from the location and taken across the country or something like that could have a substantial loss of knowledge associated with that artifact. I think ideally how people should come out and treat um, historic objects or artifacts is making sure that they're treating the site respectfully, that they don't inadvertently cause damage by what activity they're participating in. And if, for instance, they find an arrowhead, it's okay to pick it up, but put it back. Pick it up, take a picture, take the picture home with you leave the artifact exactly where you found it. Well, now I know, so I won't do it, I guess. <laughs> and so now, as I've become a professional archaeologist, I've definitely changed my perspective on 
collecting archaeological material, and I've had a huge influence on my friends and my family, uh, and teaching them that there's value in these artifacts, and that by removing them from archaeological locations, you are removing uh, any potential knowledge that we could, we could recover from these artifacts. I must believe that people have the power to know the right, to choose between good and evil, and know that their choice has made a difference. Marion Zimmer Bradley. There's the other thing that we don't really talk about, and it's racism. It's ongoing and getting at the Native American population by taking something that's really dear and close to them. So we just ponder on all those things and wonder, you just wonder, like, we're back to wonder why. What is an Indian? We may not be out, you know, wearing the war bonnets or all the other stereotypes, but we're still around and we definitely come from that past. These uh, beliefs, these, uh, these values have been instilled in us through our parents, grandparents, and that's who we are as Indian people. We, we are a people, we're a big part of what made this country. We'd appreciate, you know, people that just have respect. We're not gonna be exactly like everybody else. We have uh, certain things that we appreciate in our lifestyle. We live, you know, in the mainstream, but we still have our own beliefs and way of life that we will always cling to, hopefully. I have caught red-handed an, uh, an individual who was using a golf club to dig in burial sites, and he was looting burial goods that were left with these deceased individuals. Maybe it was put there by somebody that died. The spirit might be there. I don't know. I leave those things alone. I'd like to see that kind of behavior stopped completely, and I think it's possible through education and understanding. There were a lot of places that were closed off, and now they've been picked out. There are even places where there were grinding stones that have been dug out. I've been here 40 years and I've seen a lot of stuff taken away. To me, I always wonder why, because I wouldn't go into one of the graveyards in the valley, you know, and if I did, people around would just be, like, devastated that I even had the nerve to go do that. It should be punished. There's a lot of things like that that we just don't have anymore and it cannot be replaced. I don't want someone to go to my grandmother or grandfather's grave and take it. I also, I have homesteading roots in my family. I wouldn't want someone to go to my family's original homestead and remove some of the old buildings that have stood there for almost 100 years um, because it's a piece of my family's history. And I think if people can begin to personalize what that means, because we all have a past. This isn't only our history, it's, it's your history also. And to, for someone to come and, and gouge them out and take them away, it's, I mean, you're, you know, you're taking away your own history and particularly respect. I'm sure that every looter does not consider him, him or herself a looter. They're just out there looking at old stuff. The most recent one I found was we were in the creek last year and I found a rock approximately this big around that's solid round and it's you can tell it's been used for something you know. They do have an appreciation they know that there's something of value there I think they're confusing monetary value with the intrinsic historical value. If I saw them and they and they looked cool I would definitely pick up some artifacts and arrowheads and whatever else. It's a little insulting I think to a lot of us that have have committed ourselves 100% to preservation of data and respect for culture, and have spent a lot of time, years in school, studying this, learning how to do it right and respectfully, and for others to come in and say that they're doing the same thing and to somehow compare themselves to us is um, a little disheartening. Petroglyphs are usually hard to get to, so the fact that they took the effort to get and do them shows that they were very important to them. So you're basically denying somebody that, you know, some people their past. If they don't know what they're doing, it doesn't matter how many people we have out there enforcing or making those contacts with them. You know, usually uh, lawmakers differentiate into felonies by the amount of what's stolen, like what it's worth, and something like that's actually priceless. I mean, there's no getting it back. 
I don't think there's any way to put a monetary value on what these petroglyphs or what our other artifacts are valued at because they're um, priceless to us. You know, you can't replace that. And and that goes along with the, the does the fun, punishment fit the crime? I don't think there is a way putting somebody in jail or giving them a huge fine doesn't teach them how to respect those artifacts. There's been a number of incidents where people have been caught in, in the field office that I have firsthand knowledge. And they basically range the entire gamut from just ignorance, people out walking and they see something neat. Uh, they don't really think it's against the law or they're under the impression that, that ARPA doesn't apply to service collecting or that ARPA doesn't apply to arrowheads and they casually will pick up a neat artifact to put in their pocket. And, and these people I've approached and I've got them to put the artifact back and it was, it was handled just as a, an interface between an archaeologist and a member of the public and it was used as an educational tool. As an archaeologist, we feel that we need to manage these sites both for their potential uh, contribution to our knowledge of the past and also for their public value. You really can't manage a resource if you don't have that resource properly documented. If we had come to this site and all we found was this missing petroglyph, we'd have no idea what was actually gone. So it really speaks to the importance of documentation and luckily you know, my managers and supervisors have supported my efforts and before me my mentor Kirk Halford initiated a very uh, very aggressive program of recordation and documentation of the rock art and that's really given us the uh, ability to manage the resource. I, I think that the main reason we were actually able to recover these things is that they knew that if they held on to the petroglyphs they were putting themselves at risk because we could identify them. They couldn't really sell them on the black market because nobody was going to buy something that was so well known and so publicized and that was so well documented because all it would mean is a potential conviction. So they really didn't have any other option but either to dump them in some location or to return them. And I think they decided to return them because they figured that it would appease us and that we wouldn't try to pursue it. Um, they weren't correct about that, but, but nevertheless, I, I do contribute the fact that we got them back to the fact that we had this site thoroughly documented. I'd love to prevent it from happening. That would be ideal. And I think the only way to do that is through education, exactly, of young people, you know, older people uh, are not as susceptible to education, but it can be done. One of the best ways that we can uh, prevent instances like this from happening in the future is, is through education and also through uh, monitoring systems of these, these known locations. Uh, we, you know, we see evidence of looting happening at major archaeological sites all the time, so if we can set up systems of, of volunteers or uh, even well-informed members of the public who utilize these areas uh, to keep an eye out on these resources, that would, that would help quite a bit. In terms of the community getting involved in something like this, um, the most basic level is reporting these in suspicious incidents. Um, if um, you've noticed damage to an archaeological site, place where you like to go out hiking, whatever, let us know about that so we can uh, take appropriate action. And if you want to take it a step further, we have a volunteer program called the California Archaeological Site Stewardship Program, or CASIP, um, and that uh, essentially recruits volunteers to help monitor um, and protect sites on federal lands. I think we all need to work together. Um, the tribes, the government agencies, local community schools. Uh, with everybody's help and everybody's understanding, I think when people understand where the other side is coming from, you tend to go to a, a solution that more people buy into. There tends to be less destruction and opposition to closing off roads. It just means a better positive solution. I had an interesting situation occur probably a good 10, 10 or more years ago. I had an opportunity to go visit a site and I was there with some tribal elders from the local uh, tribe and we got to the site and the site had clearly been pot hunted and there were looters pits scattered throughout these house pits and this, this beautiful site that the state parks had been trying very hard to protect and the Native American community was very invested in this in the site and to see those destroyed like that was very disheartening. And I stood there with the tribal elders and I was shaking my head at the time and I, you know, cursing the ground those looters walked on, not understanding why they couldn't have been caught, why they had to do this. And he put his arm around me and he said, 
don't worry, he said. Bad things happen to those who pot hunt. And it really had a really profound impact on me because it made me realize, I think for the first time, that just because these sites are quote unquote abandoned, they're still used, they're still needed, they're still appreciated, and they're still alive. And I think that's something that might have been lost along the way among a lot of people. But it put my mind at rest because I knew that even though modern day law enforcement wasn't going to catch them, they would have their moment when they would realize what they did was wrong. All I want is forever. What's so hard about that? What's so hard about that? What's so hard about What's so hard about that? What's so hard about that?